This is Delani Amon thanking you for listening to Haram Bay Radio. Haram Bay, Haram Bay, Haram Bay. Working together for progress. Feel the oneness of Haram Bay. Keep it right there. Keep it right there. Keep it right there. Good evening, Harambe family. My name is Akeem Jamal, and this is Make It Plain. Uh, tonight, uh, we're going to talk about different aspects of what we call the new Negro. And we're also going to talk about the reborn African. We're going to talk a little bit about the history, especially in some type of, of context. We always like to give you uh, some insight in terms of where we want to go with this discussion. And when I started um, <clears throat> talking about this week's discussion, uh, I was reminded of what, what a young lady asked me uh, early in the week. And she says, well, Brother Keem, she says, uh, you know, <clears throat> why do you come back, you know, and, and stay in, in the hood, in the ghetto, so, so to speak? And my response to her was is that, you know, I never left. And, and <clears throat> I wanted to emphasize that because a lot of times <clears throat> people think that um, <clears throat> all the resources have left the black community, and in some cases it has. But some of the strong brothers still remain strong in the community, still rooted in, in, in this community and rooted in the struggle. <clears throat> and when we talk about... Uh, the reborn African, we have to we have to really look at what is African people's um, uh, struggle in the 21st century, and more importantly, what do we need to do? And a lot of that has to do with with leadership. And I was talking earlier with a young brother, and <clears throat> I was surprised at his, his basic concept of of, uh, of leadership. And because we live in a such an alien society in an alien culture, we tend to take on the oppressor's definition of leadership. And he was explaining to me that leadership for him meant that somebody was at the head and somebody was at the bottom, uh, and that the person was was uh, appointed at leadership. And I think we have to really get a clear understanding of what leadership is. Leadership is from the ground up, not from the top down. Uh, leadership is someone who... Uh, shows up for work at 4 o'clock in the morning uh, and doesn't leave until everybody else leaves at 4 o'clock <clears throat> in the morning. Uh, leadership is someone who works hard than anybody else, <clears throat> and leadership is doing the hard work, the dirty work that nobody else wants to do. Uh, oftentimes, that kind of leadership is not giving any kind of accolades or pat on the back, but that's not something that we expect. It has to be something that is an aid in us, something that we want to do, and it's something that, that we do uh, because we love uh, African people. <clears throat> so along the lines of when that, I want to uh, start the discussion uh, from my perspective of <clears throat> the new Negro and the reborn African. And I also want to give an example of the kind of leadership that uh, our ancestors uh, exhibited back in in the time of Hannibal's time. So when we look at um, we look at uh, today, we talk about uh, the new Negro versus the reborn African. Uh, we see that the new Negro uh, sends his children to the enemy to be educated about white history, but he knows nothing about the great civilizations of Kemet, Kush, and Songhai. The new Negro sits in church every Sunday and was told not to worship I, I, uh, Isis, uh, Horus, or Ra, but instead to worship Washington, Lincoln, and Jefferson. The new Negro lives in the suburbs and drives 50 miles one way, but won't take one step to help a homeless black person on the streets. On the other hand, the reborn African uh, teaches his children about the importance of the destruction of black civilization by Chancellor Williams and the rich history and culture of African people. The reborn African organizes co-ops, the food drives for the homeless, Africans living on the streets of America. The reborn African returning from war defends the African community like in New Orleans against the white mercenaries of Blackwater who wanted to disarm the black community. We need reborn Africans in the image and the fortitude of Hannibal Bakar. In Wayne Chandler's essay, Hannibal, Nemesis of Rome, 
from the book, The Great Leaders, Ancient and Modern, he sought to present a truthful and accurate account of Hannibal the Great, the great liberator, the great conqueror of the Roman army. Hannibal, whose name means thunderbolt, lived from 247 BCE to 183 BCE. He was known as empire builder and the greatest military commander of all times. The history of the Bacar family can be traced back to Princess Dido, and founder of the Cartridge uh, Empire, and was sister of King Palami of Tari. And Hannibal was the oldest of four children. Um, and young Hannibal, at a very young age, exemplified a certain kind of strength and leadership. In addition, Hannibal had three half-brothers, Hasabal, Hanno, and Mango. It was during the first Punic Wars against the Rome, the Hannibal Car. His father told his young son to swear an oath to rid the world of the domination of Rome. He was such a power, powerful military force that the mere mention of Hannibal's name struck fear and terror in the minds of his enemies. I want to welcome my co-host, Brother Kimmett. Make it plain. Hotel, my brother. Uh, ever since we, we started the show, I've always tried to give tongue to the ancestors and to each of their wounds. But tonight I want to do something a little different. Tonight I want to talk about our children. And I want to talk about our children in a way that, you know, maybe we can um, turn this corner and make a difference. And this is the analysis. It's a funny thing happens with our kids when they're, when they're small. After coaching a lot of years, I ran into this phenomenon when when they're five, six, seven, eight year old, you know, the parents come out, the grandparents, aunts, sisters, and brothers, and the bleachers are full, and they're cheering these kids on every game. When they get 13, you see them coming down the street by themselves with the basketball, the baseball, the football, the cleats, and it's just me and them. When they're 15, it's totally just me and them. When they look up in the fans and they, they, they see people that they care about and, and that they know, it's friends, just friends. There's no parents no more, no grandparents, no one cheering them on. It's just me and them. And then you wonder later, like uh, when, they, when they get in a situation to where uh, with a friend and, and he gets in some drama and you wonder why they have that dedication to that friend and it's because well he was always there for me so it's a funny thing happens when um we relinquish our right to be parent so we're gonna have to understand that our lack of the compassion to each other reveals profound truths that most of us are too busy rushing through our day we don't see the example we set with our inaction we live in a culture that manages to coin off a segment society as if it were a special circumstance of others. And we're going to have to take up the slack and remove the blinders of complacency and self-absorption and look out for the children. We're going to have to look out for the children. We have to tell them that they are flawless, magnificent machines, perfectly designed, one of a kind, like snowflakes. There's always one moment in a childhood when the door opens and lets the future in. We have to show them true stories about transformation and courage and practical lessons like when they're young, I tell them about ASAP. Well, when they went on a journey, you know, the slaves had to carry everything. And ASAP being a slave, he would go and he would always grab the big sack of flour. Now, everybody would ridicule him, all his friends would, you know, ride his back, you know, come on, ASAP, come carry this wood with us. But, you know, ASAP was his own man, so he just really wasn't thinking about what they were saying about him because, you know, your friend's always going to ride you. So he put the flower on his back, and they took off on a journey. And when they stopped in the morning to make breakfast, they made bread, and they used the flour. When they stopped at lunch, they made bread, and they used the flour. When they stopped for dinner, they made bread, and they used the flour. So at the end of the day, ASAP rode along. And he got his hands in his pocket whistling while his friends are still carrying a heavy load because he understood that it's okay to be your own man. It's okay to be your own man. Each tub stand on their own bottom. Your friends are always going to ride your back, but when you submit to them, then you become a robot. So it's okay to be your own man. 
Then when they get a little older, I, I make them understand this. You know, haters like air, they always going to be there. So I tell them a story, and the story goes like this. It's like, you know, two black men are out there, and they're, they're fishing. And while they're fishing on the lake, uh, the president come by. He's in a boat. The news crew and everybody's just following him while he's in the boat and while he's rolling along in the boat. And um, his hat fly off into the water. And as his hat fly off into the water, you know, the brother gets up. He walk across the water. He gets the president's hat, and he gives it back to him. Now, the next day, when they report the news, they said the brother can't swim. Forget he walked across water, but they're going to say the brother can't swim. So you can't get dissuaded about what people say about you. you got to be your own man. Then we can give them lessons like about ultra-materialism and make them understand this. Just once for everything, only once. Whatever you do in the world, you can only do it one time. When you do it again, it's not the same. Just once. So we must share the lessons of valor and hope, courage and love. That will please the ancestors. Becoming involved sharpens your visions and narrows your desires for material things. You can make a difference. This is not about bling bling. This is about let freedom ring. Arden said, we are all here on earth to help others. What on earth the, what on earth the others are here for, I don't know. I believe if children have but one person in their world who loves them fiercely, they will survive. If they don't have that assurance that they matter from at least one adult, then they are broken for life. And we're trying to help them survive. And we got to help them survive in their world, not yours. Survival first. So I want to talk about where these things we teach come from. It starts with us. It starts with us. There's always been these people on the mountain. Then there was always the poor people in the valley. I'm one of the people in the valley. I love these people that you're ashamed of because of their grammar, because they say ah and da, which is absurd to me. Have you seen inferior education they receive? Why are you not at the board of education demanding that they receive a real education? And it's funny. When the Greeks came to Africa to learn, we should say the same thing about them. Oh, they they talking to me bunnies. They can't even pronounce the words. Same thing they say about us. We say it about them. And don't block us with this nonsense that we're anti-education. We stress education every way. I coached for 20 years. It was about books and balls. We made them understand that knowledge is like vision. If I stand right here and I can see for a mile, when I get to the end of that mile, I can see for another mile. Follow Sophia, the love of wisdom. We implanted that in them from birth. From birth. So we don't want to hear those blogs. We want a curriculum that's culturally sensitive. And I'm saying grammar's good, but right now we're worried about the grams on the street. And I know people with PhDs and don't got no J-O-Bs. I mean, let's keep it real. I know people in the Republican Party that grammar is proper, but their analysis is wrong. Then we got the Democrats, once they, they call it compromise, but uh, that's selling not your principle. So they got proper grammar. But the analysis is wrong. We got a president of the United States, Barack Obama. He's got proper grammar. One of the people in his cabinet said these words. They said, I would never know he was a brother if I didn't see that jump shot when he playing outside of the White House, on the White House gym court. I've never heard this brother address the fact that he was a brother well, I've never heard him even acknowledge we exist since he's been in the White House. So it's okay. You know, we're not saying, um, you know, not have proper grammar. But what we're saying is everybody matters and everybody counts. That's what Brother Fred meant when he said some people think they are better than the people. That's an insult. And that's a disgrace. No one's better than no one. I mean, if I right now, I could take anybody 
with the best gram in the world. And if I dropped him off in Africa, his Swahili would be suspect. But that phenomenon is funny to me because why is it just us? Why do we have to totally be somebody else? I can go to DMV right now, and they got a they got a, a book in Asian and Chinese and Russian and everything else. And it's funny. When these people, they call it broken grammar, but they don't have to be totally someone else to be in America. Why do we have to be totally someone else? Why do we have to be totally someone else? That's my analysis. I can make it plain. You know, uh, Brother Kimmy, you said something that was very, very profound. You said that we have to have love and courage. You know, it, it, it takes the courage to stand up and not only do the right thing, but do what's right. And also it takes love. It takes love for our people. And when, you know, the first teacher, the first teacher of our kids is the parents. The first teacher. You know, one of the things that, that Hannibal learned at the age of nine years old was his father said, look, across the water there, there are people who don't like you. They are your enemy. And they are every day of moving and living for your demise. Never forget that. You know, I, I want to come back to, to, to Hannibal in, in, in a moment. You know, Hannibal, th this great military leader from Cartridge. But I want to talk about when that if we start off down the wrong ro around the wrong road, we end up in the wrong place. So, so as Brother Kimmy was talking about, we have to have a correct analysis. You know, we can't say, look, you know, how we get out of this situation? You know, we tried voting. That didn't work. Maybe we needed to start swinging. We started singing. Maybe we should do less singing and more swinging. You know, we tried marching. That didn't work. Maybe we need to do a little bit more swinging. We tried getting proper education. Because they, we thought all those things was going to get us free. We thought if we elected black mayors and black governors and eventually a black president, we thought that we would get free. We're not free. The only way that we're going to get free is the same way we got in this situation. The same way that when the net was thrown over us and our, our reality turned black, we have to cut the net and fight our way back. That's the only way. We're going to get back to center. I feel that, that we need to deal with the fact that many of our black youth, black young men, black young women, uh, do not really realize the importance the role that, that black men and women played, not only in the history of this country, but the history of Africa. Our children are growing up in schools and colleges and never been told about the history and accomplishments of African people. They know nothing of Carter G. Woodson, of, of uh, George Washington Carver, or uh, James Baldwin, or Ralph Ellison's um, Invisible Man, or James Baldwin's The Fire Next Time. These are giants among men. And every time we see a picture or a drawing of Hannibal, for example, when it, he is portrayed as someone European, someone who has blue eyes, Today, when we see the same images of white Europeans hanging in black churches on Sunday in Sunday literature, we have to realize that the only pe people was on this earth was African people. African people talk to other African people. And in the course of talking to ourselves, when it, we invented spirituality. We invented mathematics. We invented architecture. We invented science. We invented geometry. We invented algebra and more. We have to realize that the invasion of European in the 7th century, they hadn't invented anything. Therefore, for the sake of our children, for the sake of African people, for the sake of our future, for the sake of truth, we must tell the truth about our legacy, about our history of African people that brought civilization to the world. This is the only way that we can move forward as a people. Therefore, 
With that in mind, I want to turn back to the story of Hannibal Bacar of Cartridge. The story begins when Hannibal takes the reins of power after his father, Hamilcar, and his brother, Apazal, were killed. At the age of 25, Hannibal assumed leadership and amassed the largest army of Africans, Moors, and Gauls, and other forces to end the rule of Rome. Hannibal's mighty army struck first at Sarconium, an ally of Rome, and laid the city to waste. Rome sent a delegation to Carthage to intimidate the people and to say that you didn't authorize Hannibal to attack one of our allies. And they said he gave a message to the Carthage Senate, and they said, we, the people of Rome, bring you peace or war. Take whichever you wish, whichever you will. To which extent the senators of Carthage replied, whatever you please, we don't care. And the Romans play, replied, then we give you war. And the Carthians replied, we accept. By then, and his army had already crossed the Pyrenees Mountains and the Alps in, into Italy and on their way to Rome. We, have, we tell these stories because we wanted to emphasize that this leader, she was, he was elected by the people. Hannibal was not someone that was appointed. He was a part of the people. He felt that his struggle was their struggle, and he was their spokesman. That's what a true leader is, a servant of the people, not someone who's above the people. As Brother Kim has said, that is criminal. Brother Kim, make it plain. You know, it's funny, um... I'm going to keep it on the kids tonight because, you know, this is where my passion is and, and this is where my plea to you is to understand this. Let's talk about the evolution of that little kid that the grandparents and everybody came out to support. And let's talk about how you get to be that kid like T. Rogers talking about that cleared the block. Here's a kid standing here, AK smoking, cleared the block. Rats and roaches is running. Everybody's closing the door. The windows is coming down cleared the block and he's standing there with the gun smoking what kind of power do you think he have and what go what goes on in his head to get to that point the gun smoking he cleared the block and it's a funny thing that happens in this phenomenon and don't think it's hopeless I have brothers that I just encountered a few months ago arch enemies one on the blue side, one on the red side. If they came into the same space, it would be murder. But I believe in miracles. I watched these brothers at the end of the day. The conversation went like this. You know, we don't get enough support from other black men like we should. So we always have a shortage in rides and stuff. Because like I say, when you're 15, 16, 17, 18, nobody comes out. It's just me and them. So we taking kids back and forth in the shuttle, me and my son. And the funny thing is, there's a couple of kids. They live in the area, maybe five blocks. And to you, it's okay. It's five blocks. They, you know, they 18, 17 years old. They can walk five blocks. Not these five blocks. So here's a brother that three months earlier would have taken this brother's life, and it the words went like this. Well, no. I'm going to walk with my homie here so we both can be safe. Now, here's arch enemies. Here's the brothers that would have stunned, stood there and cleared the block. And cleared the block. And people say, like, uh, what do you say to him? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Because we failed you. And we let you down. We let you down when welfare took men out the house and we didn't fight for you. We let you down with the school systems when we're not there in droves every day seeing why my kids not being educated. We let you down at the chance we had at revolution and we didn't stand up like men. We literally let you get stuck, bogged down by the weight of a single emotion like anger and sadness. Or whatever else it is, that's you, Chobar. 
That's what I say to him. I'm sorry. And now I'm present and accounted for. Because that's what they've always needed from us. Just us. Just us. Then we can show them what responsibility is. And we have to help them demand more out of life. They have been unwanted all their life. We can make them feel somebody wants them. Somebody cares about them. I apologize. That's what I say. Make it plain. You know, what Brother Kimmon is talking about is that, you know, we have been separated from from our cultural and historical roots. And, and you know, one of the things that the Gwarvi said is that, is that, you know, it is the fruit, it is the root of the tree that bears the fruit. We have to look at over the last 30 years when there's been a vacuum of leadership. When, sure, there was an influx of drugs in the community. Sure, when there was black people who left the hood and went to the suburbs. Sure, there were black people who got nice, cushy jobs. Sure, there was the three strikes laws. Sure, they murdered Mark Clark, Fred Hampton, Bunchy Carter, Malcolm X, and Martin Luther King and Megger Everett. One, most, one thing that is left out of that equation is that the generation that came up in the 70s and the 80s abandoned their responsibility and they sold out the African community. And by selling out, they left us without the leadership and without the strength to carry on the struggle. And I think that we have to call a spade a spade. Because if we don't look at where those mistakes were made, what we end up doing is continue to make the same mistakes over and over again. So what, do you, what is left is a community and that, that, that some people call neglected. Well, neglected means at some point in time, I'm going to come back and see about you. No, it's not the neglect in, in South Central Los Angeles, in the South Ward, in South out of Chicago and the South Bronx is not neglect. It is by design. It is by design. It's by design that we have our communities that are dilapidated. Men standing on corners. Sisters when they're not knowing how to be mothers to raise up another generation. We have to take the responsibility just as Hannibal, father, Amakar, placed that responsibility. The minute he put that, that sword in his hand, he said, it's your responsibility to lead by example. The Roman general, Sepulchro, surprised by the crossing of Hannibal's army and 21 elephants, moved hastily to intercept and destroy the nemesis of Rome. But Hannibal had almost a three-day lead and forged alliance with the Gaul after mediating the speech between two brothers. And some of the men were tired and homesick and ravished from war. And Hannibal arrived to face the heart of the Roman legion, but only 20, 26,000 of his original men and 14,000 of his Gaul allies. Hannibal positioned himself at Po Valley, just 50 miles from Rome, from the gates of Rome. General Cipro, since the Hannibal's men were tired, weary, and possibly low morale, rallied his Roman legions and spoke a quick defeat for the defiance of Carthage. He wanted to put down this defiant black man, Hannibal. At any given time, Rome was known to put a half a million men on the battlefield at a moment's notice. However, they were about to face the mighty general of Carthage, Hannibal, the Thunderbolt, the most feared army on the face of the earth. Hannibal, Sipacol met on the battlefield before the two armies engaged each other. 
The recall called to Hannibal that he faced insurmountable odds against the well-trained Roman army. He urged Hannibal to surrender and take his men home. Hannibal refused to surrender. He told the Roman general that his day had come, and that he would feel the sharp steel blade through his cold heart. The first meeting on the battlefield was more like a secure skimmage in a fight. And Hannibal's army and his elephants round, routed the Romans and gave them their first defeat. The Roman general Sibico was wounded and was helped out the field by his son. Unable to continue, he gave the command of the Roman army to Simprinius, who was rash and eager to fight Hannibal and make a name for himself. Brother Kimmett. Make a plan. If we could just stop blaming ourselves for a moment, we could maybe begin to really understand the power of mind control and how it works. Then, very objectively, we must begin to deal analytically in trying to solve the problem. In not fully understanding the intricacies of the workings of the mind, we more often than not make the wrong conclusion. In our judgment of people in general, but especially about the black race as a whole. We got to stop playing these games and we got to start talking to our kids and making them understand that they're important. Make them understand that we care. You know, and it, it blows me away that people don't understand how this culture done creeped up on us and how our kids are getting absorbed into this game mentality. It's pretty simple to me. When the only brother you know supported you all your life says, I'll die for you, Holmes. I'll kill for you, Holmes. You better hope someone else had said that to that kid first. I've been in a position with these kids since it's just been me and them for all of these years. That if their mother and father ask them to do something and I ask them not to do it, they wouldn't do it. So for you, you better be glad that my moral code is in order. We relinquish these rights to protect our kids and help them survive. And don't get it twisted. It ain't a DNA thing. It's a love thing. Anybody can care about a anybody can care about care about a child, and everybody should. And everybody should. And we have to help them survive in a practical way, and not make them think that their value and their worth is in words that they can express with the right dialect. Or they insignificant. What happened to common sense? I had a brother tell me one time and never seen a school book or wouldn't even know how to read page one. But he said these words to me. I got common sense. If I got a cow and I'm giving him a hundred dollars worth of grain and he giving me fifty dollars worth of milk, he finna be steak. Common sense. Common sense. Things that's going to help you survive is what our kids need. Bougie is cool, but it don't change the problem. It don't help anyone. I've never seen a person in my existence walk into the mall to solve gang banging. I've never seen a person walk into the department store to stop the plight in the ghetto. No one's ever told me about that mall you can go in and can change the conditions of your people that's starving. I know people going to church on Sunday, get them their last quarter, and have to make it through the rest of the month with dog food. We don't talk about them people. But I give these people a face and a tongue because I love them. What happened to your ability to love them? What happened to your capacity to open up your heart and give back? And we're not talking money here. Our kids don't need money. They need you present and accounted for. They need you to just let them understand that somebody care about me. Somebody care about me. 
someone loves me. And then you can give them other lessons. But first, you got to be a good role model. Honest in truth and deed. Showing tough love when necessary. Stop delegating your responsibility of your kids to other people. Teach raise pride. And don't get it twisted. This is not a racist thing. White power to white people. Black power to black people. Brown power to brown people. Don't gossip with your children. Don't give in to your child. Command respect from your child. Tell them you love them. 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 And then tell them again. And have the fierceness of your conviction behind that. We've done for everybody else on the planet. Now it's time to do for self. And we start with the most vulnerable. We're going to have to look out for our children. We're going to have to teach our children how to look out for the elders. And how to respect ancestorship. We talk about our ancestors because we're giving tongue to each one of their wounds. But now I'm talking to you about the most vulnerable among us, our children. Stop acting like you don't understand why they're getting gangs. You were not there first. The gangs was there first. And even these brothers have value. There's redemption in them too. I've witnessed it. I've watched that miracle of a lost child finding themselves. And the funny thing about these children, once they find themselves, they'll have a loyalty to you that you have never seen from bourgeois E. King, make a plain. You know, I, I taught a class and the youngsters were so beat down and so demoralized that the only thing that came out their mouth was, I can't do it. It's too hard. And I told them, I said, just try. Just make your best effort. I'm trying to get the answer. I said, we're not trying to get the answer. We're trying to learn the process. Because once you learn the process, the 2 plus 2 equals 4, the 1 plus 1 plus 1 equals 4, 2 times 2 equals 4, once you understand the process, it doesn't matter because you automatically lead to the, the answer. And for every time that they said that they couldn't do it, had to put a quarter in a big jar. And I said, at the end of the year, we're going to have a big party. And about six months into the school year, I saw that the, the jar was getting less and less. Because we had replaced can't with I, we can do. We have replaced it's too hard with give me something harder. Mm. On that day, it was a fog that rolled in, and Hannibal went to his troops. And people were complaining. They said, well, it's too many of them. They, they got more armament than we have. And, and they're, they've been better trained than, than we are. And Hannibal told his troops, but you are the better fighters. He said, remember, he said, you're fighting for your home. You're fighting for your, your family. You're fighting for your children. On that decisive meeting between Hannibal and Sopiticus took place at the Red River, Trabia, first Hannibal had his slingers and the archers aimed directly at the tight formation of the Roman legions. Then he directed his Af Af uh, elephants to charge the middle and this caused major confusion. While Hannibal's main army was on the right and the left flank of the Roman legions, Mango, his brother, had circled around the Romans and were attacking him from the rear with his horses. The Romans were outmaneuvered, outflanked all sides. The Romans broke rank and hastily retreated. How long does it take to slaughter 150,000 Romans? The decisive battle would rage well over six hours. This was a stunning defeat for the Roman army. Hannibal was less than 50 miles from the gates of Rome. As Channel stated, the poet Florus 
compared Hannibal and his army to the lightning bolt launched from the sky, which pierced through the Alps to strike Italy. Hannibal Bacara, the black thunderbolt from Cartridge, and the man who struck fear in the hearts of every Roman citizen. It is hard to believe that one black man stood up to the Roman Empire. And many would like to feel, like, like Hannibal, that we are surrounded by overwhelming odds. And we don't feel like that we can be the instrument of our own freedom. We feel that nothing can be done against white domination. When we go to Africa, the enemy is riding our backs. When we go to South America, the enemy is riding our backs. When we go to the Caribbean, the enemy is riding our backs. When we go to Detroit, the enemy is riding our backs. When we go to New York, the enemy is riding our backs. We go to Los Angeles, the enemy's riding our backs. But in the midst of all this exploitation and oppression, we should heed the real words of Hannibal. The day of reckoning is coming. The day of reckoning is coming. Because as Frederick Douglass says, struggle may be a moral one. It may be a physical one. Or it may be both a moral and a physical struggle. But it must be a struggle. Power concedes nothing without a man. And the day of reckoning is coming because Marcus Garvey was right. People without knowledge of their past, origin, history, and culture, it's like a tree without roots. The day of reckoning is coming because Malcolm said that nobody can give you freedom. Nobody can give you equality and justice. If, you want, if you're a man, you take it. We must keep on fighting for justice until it comes. We need to keep on fighting until freedom comes. Young people, don't get discouraged. Don't give up the good fight. Fight on until your day comes. Mothers, don't give up the pressures every day life. Father, don't let the obstacles get in your way. Fight on till your day come. Brother Kimmett, make it plain. Yeah, um, the beautiful thing about being around the youth is you have an opportunity to talk to them about stories of the past and stories of the present and hope for the future because this is what we're talking about here. We're talking about hope. And I've always understood what they're dealing with psychologically, so I've always tried to share stuff with them about the parents, about the mothers and the fathers and the grandparents, because a lot of times we have a disconnect there too. So when I'm talking to the young boys, I tell them the story. In the constellation of my family life, I'd always been aligned with my mother. What my father and my mother did best together was fight. Doors were slammed and voices raised. What it was all about, I was never certain. Whenever my parents became too loud, my older sisters were expert at shelling me off into my bedroom and closing the door. When my parents split apart, I was in the second grade. My father visited, but it was perfunctory and resulted in more arguments. So what was so wrong with him, everything according to my mother, I was a he was a pack rat who collected stacks of papers and hoarded so much junk that we had to carve paths through the maze. His car was so filled with random trash, boxes, papers, and bicycle wheels that my mother wouldn't allow him to park it near the house. She was ashamed of him, and I followed suit. Taking cues from her, obviously he valued stuff over us, his family. My father had his own story, of course, but I was unable to see it. To see him as a separate person apart from his role as my failed parent. But following my mother's sudden death, there I was in my mid-twenties with my father, the surviving parent. For the first time, my mother wasn't there telling me how uh, awful, how bad he was. After he fell ill and moved to an assisted living facility, I began to visit him regularly and have long talks with him about his own perspectives and life experiences. It was at this late date that I finally began to understand my father. As a child of the Depression, he grown up with no little, so little as a boy that material objects gradually became to symbolize security and began to see that his hoarding was most likely an obsessive compulsive disorder that had developed over the years and had never been diagnosed. Although he hadn't seen a great parent, he hadn't been a great parent, he had many other admirable qualities. He spent his working life teaching math and business in the Bronx. Even after school became violent, he was attacked at gunpoint. He stayed on, never missing a day. In this and many other ways, he was far from a horrible man. 
Remember, true love doesn't have a happy ending. True love doesn't have an ending at all. Hotel. Make you know, it plain, Akeem. You know, one of the things that, that Hannibal did after he surveyed the carnage, saw that over 150,000 Romans were slaughtered that day. And another 50,000 ran from the battlefield. And Brother Hannibal gathered his generals around and he wanted their advice. He said, should we strike where the iron is hot or do we wait till tomorrow? And without a doubt, his, his general said, we need to strike while the iron is hot. And Hannibal realizing that his men were tired and weary and wasn't aware of the force that he was going to expect when he got to Rome. But what he didn't know was that the legion that was guarding Rome was just a ceremonial group. They never engaged in any battle. But the word went out all over the empire that Rome is under siege to come back and save Rome. And that next day, when, when Hannibal got to the gates of Rome, some legions had marched for three days. It was a fierce battle. Another one in which Hannibal won. But there's a lesson to be learned here. We have to strike when the iron is hot. A lot of times we think that we have another, another day or another week or another month, another five or another ten years to get it right. We got to strike while the iron is hot. Some of us think when that, that we find solitude, you know, in going back into to religion, into the church, we need to strike while the, while the iron is hot. I was talking to a sister the other day, and she was expressing when that, her understanding of religion, and she said, well, I know there's a difference between African spirituality and European. And I said, but sister, you missed the point. The point is, is that, you're looking at a replica, a duplicate, something that's distorted. Because we were the only original people that invented spirituality. This is not spirituality or what the European practice. What the European practice is a form of white domination. And because we live under white domination, we think that, that somehow religion is, is escaped from white domination. So what you are seeing every Sunday morning is a perpetuation, an indoctrination of white, domi of white domination. We cannot use their tools to make analysis. We cannot use their tools to make any kind of analysis. Because when we came to Africa, when the European first came to Africa, we had the land, and they had the Bible. When they left, they had the land, and we had the Bible. Why would you think that, that your oppressor is going to put anything in a book that's going to free you? Why would, he, why would you think someone who enslaved you would put anything in a book that would set you free? Why do you think the same person that put the chains on you and, and, and drags you to the boat is going to give you a book that's going to free you. The only way that we're going to get free is the same way we got in this mess. We're going to have to fight our way out of it. So when the sons and daughters of Shaka Zulu and Harriet Tubman and Marcus Garvey and Malcolm X stand strong on every street corner facing racist dogs and police attacks every day, when the heirs of Malcolm pick up the gun and arm with truth, and only when they can put the last first and the first last, only then will we have the masses of oppressed people be free. Brother Kimmy, make it plain. It's an amazing thing, you know. Um, I'm, cause tonight with me, you know, it's all it's all about us, man. It's, it's, it's all about us. It's all about 
how can we get each other to love each other and understand the importance of this moment and the importance of, of now and, and how to take a different look at the brother because he's not up to your standards of, of, of the, what's been put in your mind that he's not up to par. And par is he's breathing. If he's breathing and he's a brother, he's up to par to me, and I love him. And we got to understand this. I mean, I have my issues with, with Martin Luther King, but he said something that, that resonated with me. I didn't take his position on nonviolence and never will, but my thing is this. The brother says this. Once he was stabbed, he was um. His statement was okay. You know, I got while he was laying in the hospital. I got letters from uh, dignitaries from around the world, from presidents, from uh, actors and entertainers and stars and all of these people. He said, but I got this one letter from a little girl down in Georgia. And the little girl said, well, you know, uh, Dr. King, uh, you know, my teacher was telling us about that if the, the, the blade would have been one more inch over, you would have died. And Dr. King, I just want to say, you know, I'm glad it wasn't one more inch. And out of all the letters he got from presidents and dignitaries and all of these other people, that was the one resonated with him. I feel him on that one because that's who I am. I feel the brother that don't nobody else care about. I feel the brother that's looked over. I feel the little kid that wondering why no one cares about me. And I feel they pain. I feel they pain. And at some point, you're going to have to feel they pain. And you don't understand what it can do for you because to be of use gives our days meaning and focus. And it's especially crucial for those of us who face life in America who feel physically diminished, dependent on others, stripped of our prior identities. We gonna have to see each other if no one else does. And speaking of this brother Martin Luther King, he was a man of peace. But everywhere you go in the State of the Union and it's a street called Martin Luther King Boulevard, there's violence on it. There's violence on it. So what does that say about how far we've came? And I'm saying this, like I say every week we're our welfare. We're our way out. We're going to have to have the compassion for the children. We have to have the compassion for the elders. And we're going to have to help see ourselves through this. We're going to have to help each other see our way through this. Or it won't be a through this. Hotel, and I love you. Everybody. You know, I just want to say in closing that there is no record on history where where people who have not held on to their, their culture have survived. Uh, there's no record on history where uh, uh, people have not made a commitment towards restoring their family. And, and this is something that, that we held on to uh, even after slavery. We're walking up and down the roads looking for our aunts and uncles and our mothers and fathers and, and sons and daughters, and everybody thought we were crazy, but we were trying to reconnect those old bones, and so we have to begin to focus on those things that work. We must have a strategy for success when that the cumulative effects of abortion, when that has devastated the black community, the cumulative effects of drugs have devastated the black community, the cumulative effects of locking up brothers and sisters when at the rate of, of 1.5 million people in this country has a cumulative effect we have got to formulate a strategy for success. And that strategy has to deal with the weapon of truth. We have to arm every black man, woman, and child with the truth so that we can begin to stand up and protect our families, our communities. Brothers and sisters, tonight we just wanted to have a fireside chat to give some things that, that have been on our minds and on our, our chest and to put some things in perspective, we've had some outstanding guests on here. We've had Professor Earl Grant on here who told us some things about Malcolm. We have Pam Africa who said they should not give up the struggle until Mamiya is free. We had Willie Mikasa Ricks said uh, Martin Luther King was a mobilizer, but we were the organizers. We've had Brother Hank, Hank uh, Jones who says, look, just like the enemy, learns, we have to learn. We have to have a strategy for success. If we don't formulate a strategy for success, there's no guarantee that we're going to be here in the 21st century. i just like to read one last word. It says here, an African proverb, a real leader has no need to lead. He is content to point the way. Brother Kim, make a play. I just want to say on a personal note to Delaney, 
and on Rumble Radio. Just thanks for giving, um, you know, I'm going to be honest. When we first came on the show, everybody was like, well, you know, who's Brother Kemet? You know, and I'm not, poor, I'm not important to you. I'm important to the people that know me, the people that I walk with and struggle with on a daily basis, the people that, you know, most people just pretty much look over, and I'm, I'm being honest about that. And I, I just want to thank the Lenny for giving us a voice because I'm one of them people. You know, I'm a true field Negro. Hotel. There's always room for the, in the field, for the field when they grow. This has been Brother Keem, Brother Kimmett, Make It Plain. Hotel, Black Power, good night.